Okay, well, well, thank you all. Um, my name is Matthew Engelke. I'm the director of the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, and I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's event. Um, this is the first event of the semester, and it's really good to be back. Um, the most um, immediate impetus for this event was the uh, recent appointment of uh, Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. But in fact, the idea for this event stretches back um, to about two years ago when uh, Catherine Frankie and I uh, were having a conversation and I'll introduce Catherine in, in a minute who's gonna be chairing this evening. We were having a conversation about the Supreme Court and she was um, uh, telling me very interesting things about the ways in which um, Justice Kennedy um, and his legal reasoning and his faith um, intersected and did not. And um, ever since then, I've thought that this would be a, a, a wonderful event to hold. Um, there's a lot of Catholicism in, in the air and the national um, public right now. So uh, it seemed like a, a perfect time to, to do it. Um, so I, I will uh, introduce Catherine in just in just a minute, but first of all, let me just say a few things about um, the, the the structure of this evening's event. So um, Professor Frankie will uh, introduce the panelists, all of whom will then speak for about ten minutes each. Uh, the panelists and uh, Professor Frankie will then have a um, conversation for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we will open up the floor to Q&A from you all. Um, you should be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom screen a Q&A function. Uh, so if you click on that, you can type in your questions at any point from, from now until the end of the evening, and we'll go until 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please feel free at any point to type your question into the Q&A box and Catherine will be able to then sort through them and pose them to our panelists uh, when we get to that point of the evening. Right, so um, let me turn now to just saying um, a brief word of uh, welcome and thanks to Catherine Frankie, um, who is the James Dorr Professor of Law here at Columbia, where she also directs the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law, and is the faculty director of the Law, Rights, and uh, Religion Project. She's also a member of the Executive Committee for the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and the Center for Palestine Studies. She's the author of uh, two books, most recently, Repair, Redeeming the Promise of Abolition, uh, and before that, Wedlocked, uh, The per Perils of Marriage Equality. Um, I'm really glad that Catherine uh, was willing to, to not only chair this evening, but also to um, help think about how to, how to construct this panel and, and the event. It's, it's a wonderful partnership with her and with the Law, Rights and Religion Project over at the law school. So um, Catherine, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited about this uh, evening. As, as Matthew said, he and I have been talking for a while about the relationship of the um, faith traditions of members of the Supreme Court and their secular commitments as judges enforcing the law and how they manage those um, normative worlds that they are deeply committed to. And so our panelists today will provide different and wonderful perspectives on these complicated questions. So in order of their presentations, um, first we'll have Julie Byrne, who holds the Monsignor Thomas J. Hartman Chair uh, in Catholic Studies and is a professor of religion and chair of the Department of Religion at Hofstra University. She writes and teaches widely on subjects related to US uh, religion and culture. In 2018, she was awarded a grant by the Public Scholars Program of the National Endowment for the Humanities for her work on her third book on the memory of 9-11 and tri-state suburban Catholicism. Her second book, The Other Catholics, Remaking America's Largest Religion, and her first book, O God of Players, The Story of the Immaculata Mighty Max, 
um, were both published by Columbia University Press. And as you can see, her work obviously renders her absolutely the best person. One, it's one of the three best people to be talking about these issues tonight. Our second speaker will be um, Jonathan Cavillo, who is an assistant professor of sociology of religion at Boston University School of Theology. His scholarship examines religion, racial and ethnic formation, migration, and urban cultural movements among Latinx populations. He's a sociologist by training and integrates ethnographic research with historical research to better understand how Latinx people in the US are shaped by Latinx histories from generations past. Dr. Cavillo's recently published book, The Saints of Santa Ana, examines the ethnic identity formation of Catholic and evangelical Mexican immigrants. He is especially interested in the patterns of engagement between Catholics and Protestants. So thank you so much. Also incredibly rich background for this discussion. And then bringing up the last uh, position of the three speakers is uh, Marianne Case, who holds the Arnold I. Schur Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. Marianne's expertise is remarkably diverse, ranging from German contract law to theological anthropology to the First Amendment. But her scholarship to date has drawn from an even broader area of, um, uh, of writing and thinking, concentrating on the regulation of sex, gender, sexuality, religion, and family, and the early history of feminism. And I myself have drawn very much from Marianne's work in my own writing and have um, appreciated her as a real leader in the legal academy in thinking complexly about these different normative universes and how they relate to one another. So let's begin with Julie Byrne and then we'll move to Jonathan Calvillo and then Marianne Case and then some, some conversation between them. And then your, we welcome your comments and thoughts. So um, Julie Byrne, please take it away. Hi everyone, just making sure you can hear me. Yes, I'm unmuted, great, okay. And thanks so much to everyone out there for being here. Amy Coney Barrett, born in January of 1972, is about three and a half years younger than I. She was born two months after my next oldest sister. Amy Coney Barrett and I have many things in common. She grew up in a middle-class Roman Catholic family of seven, seven siblings in Louisiana and was educated by Dominican nuns. I grew up in a middle-class Roman Catholic family of five siblings in Pennsylvania and was educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph. We're both women with Irish heritage and other white ethnic background. Our two sets of parents were both intensely affected by the happenings of the Second Vatican Council and raised us with unusual amounts of connection to Catholic institutions, home infusions of Catholic history and culture, consciousness of Catholic identity, which included US clerical priorities like pro-life activism. We both used foundations in K through 12 years of Catholic school to gain undergraduate and graduate degrees, both at non-Catholic undergraduate institutions. But for all the similarities, Amy Coney Barrett and I are so different too. Whereas her parents' navigation of the tumult after Vatican II led them to Catholic charismatic renewal, and then a conservative Christian covenant community called People of Praise, my parents' journey through the same involved campaigning for George McGovern and starting local chapters of Amnesty International, using all that Catholic education to teach college level religious studies and eventually as their last child graduated from high school and the Pope John Paul II years wore on, ceasing to go to mass. Whereas Amy Coney Barrett made school, job, and family choices that sustained her covenantal community life, my siblings and I made choices that involved different overlapping communities, remixing given Catholic identity into improvised Catholic and ex-Catholic identities. Whereas Amy Coney Barrett's religious commitments nestled alongside formation and mentorship in Republican circles, 
my religious background increasingly urged political affiliations and stances in the exact opposite direction. My point here is not to get deep into the biographies of two white American Catholic women born right after Vatican II. Rather, it's just this, with all our similarities, if Amy, Amy Coney Barrett and I turned out so differently, does the fact of common Catholicism in our background even matter? I would say it does matter in some stories, stories about the diversity of US Roman Catholicism, its post-Vatican II cleaving into liberal and conservative sides, its momentous 50% movement into the Republican party and the current political indistinguishability of Catholics from the rest of the US population. But common Catholicism in divergent lives does not matter in other stories. I doubt it matters in the story we're telling tonight, despite the title of our event, Catholics and the Court. Our prompt act asks how, if at all, can we trace the influences of Catholicism on judicial reasoning? My first impulse is to say that we can't at all. Whatever is called Catholic in the decisions of Catholic Supreme Court justices is so capacious a term as to be meaningless. In US public discourse today, Catholic usually just means wonderfully liberal or horribly liberal or wonderfully conservative or horribly conservative, depending on the inclinations of the speaker. So though Justice Sotomayor and Justice Thomas, for example, both attended Catholic elementary school and high school, whatever Catholicism shapes their legal outlooks now has no unified referent other than the hodgepodge of public uses of the word Catholic by Americans, including by the justices themselves. Then again, maybe we can say there are Catholic influences in Supreme Court judicial reasoning. If you add a lot of adjectives to say what kind of Catholicism you mean. Justice Sotomayor's decisions, such as in Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania and Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo, both in 2020, evince a social justice leaning Catholicism with a soft spot for nuns and religious freedom, tempered by support for the common good as administered by a welfare state. Justice Thomas's decisions in the same cases showcase the Catholicism of the beloved community exiled in a hostile modern world that is on the basis of religious freedom, justified in self-protection from a state that does not support its flourishing. These could both be examples of Catholic influence, neither more authentic or real than the other. There's no pure Catholicism apart from these extended descriptions and the political dimensions of any religion are always features, not bugs. But it's still tricky to call these stances Catholic influence because what else went into making Sotomayor a liberal justice? Probably not just Catholic school and church, but also her life as a Puerto Rican girl in the Bronx who lost her father early and got involved in activism at Princeton. What else went into making Thomas a conservative justice? probably not just Catholic school and church, but also living with his up with your bootstraps grandfather and reading Thomas Sowell and Anne Rand. There's nothing Catholic about any of those life experiences, but there are Catholic lives that are infinitely complicated in which Catholic influence selected out here or there does not nail down what Catholicism is, but really just reflects momentary practices of desire to make of something its Catholicity. I'm not the first to say this, of course. The Supreme Court has been majority Catholic since Samuel Alito was confirmed in 2006. And since then reporters have been asking experts, what gives with all the Catholics? John Gehring, Catholic program director at the Washington-based clergy network work faith in public life said, quote, it's just coincidental. My colleague at Baylor University, Alicia Kaufman, 
noted that, quote, the composition of the Supreme Court has never reflected the composition of the country since throughout the court's history, some groups, notably Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Unitarians, and Jews, have been significantly overrepresented in comparison to their prevalence in the American population. My colleague Margaret McGinnis at LaSalle University said that the salient factor for recent appointees was not their Catholicism, but their conservatism. Some experts have suggested that there are more Catholic Supreme Court justices and um, a disproportionate number of Catholics in Congress too, about 30%, whereas the US population of Catholics is about 20% because Catholics have historically gone into the legal profession more frequently. But I have not found any evidence of that. And to me, that 30% just reflects the same disproportionate 30% that you find in Catholics attending non-Catholic colleges and, and universities in the US, which is a class issue unrelated to any particular profession. Others have gone even further. In 2010, when Elena Kagan was nominated to the court, my Boston University colleague Stephen Prothero's CNN column was titled, Do Six Catholics Plus Three Jews Equal Nine Protestants? His argument was that the Catholicism or Judaism required to make it to the Supreme Court had to be a kind capable of being subsumed in the implicit Protestantism of the US legal system subsumed in what scholars of religion call public Protestantism or civil religion, or even just in a kind of Catholicism or Judaism that has been heavily Protestantized. Citing a conversation with another of our colleagues, Nora Rubel at the University of Rochester, Prothero wrote, quote, today many US Catholics and Jews think like Protestants. They believe that religion is something we choose as individuals rather than inherit as communities. And they view it primarily in terms of faith rather than practice. They are all Jamesian American Protestants following William James, who famously defined religion as quote, the feelings, acts and experiences of individual men in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Arguably all the Catholic justices on the court regard Catholicism as a highly individual matter about deeply held beliefs and thus in terms of their judicial reasoning are functional Jamesian Protestants. But what the Supreme Court's Catholic members do interestingly do is represent the considerable diversity of US Catholicism, men and women, black, white and Latina, different class and educational backgrounds, different political formations. There is even a non-Roman Catholic on the court. Neil Gorsuch was raised Roman Catholic and now attends an Episcopal church. The Anglican communion of which the Episcopal church is a part has always described itself as both Protestant and Catholic, though not Roman Catholic. When Gorsuch got his PhD in law from Oxford University in 2004, he wrote a thesis under Roman Catholic legal philosopher John Finnis concerning the moral status of assisted suicide. Of all the Catholics on the court, if we're talking specifically about the Roman intellectual tradition and judicial reasoning, there might be the most trackable influence in the case of the one Episcopalian. Thanks so much, and I look forward to more conversation. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Jonathan, please. Great, thank you so much. So good to be here. <clears throat> so as a sociologist of religion, I'm deeply interested in how Catholicism shapes judicial reasoning within the Supreme Court. It is arguably one of the best times at which to engage this question. And for scholars of religion, it is imperative to note the prominent roles that Catholics currently hold in our nation. It is particularly uh, of import to notice the fact that the Catholicism represented is diverse and multifaceted. One need only look at the Catholic representation at the Biden-Harris inauguration. Among representatives there, we find John Roberts, 
Lady Gaga, Jennifer Lopez, Sonia Sotomayor, and poet Amanda Gorman, parishioner of St. Bridget's in Los Angeles, a parish of the Josephites, a religious community committed to serving the African-American community. As someone from Southern California originally, I had to give that shout out. So uh, this is an inspiring vision when considering the history of discrimination wielded upon Catholics in the US. Often Catholics were faced with suspicion and hatred fueled by religious prejudice, often energized by nativist sentiments. Acceptance of Catholics in positions of power was often tempered by suspicion that Catholics would prioritize allegiance to the Pope over allegiance to the nation. Such sentiments have largely been subdued, but it wasn't that long ago that they were part of public discourse in the US. Let us remember that President Biden is only the second Catholic president of the United States. Moving forward, I propose three social dynamics that shape the influence of Catholicism in the professional lives of the Supreme Court justices. I most typically approach matters of religion from a lived religion perspective, that is, I place emphasis on how religion is practiced in everyday ways. The three social dynamics I propose are intra-group divergence, institutional pronouncements, and individual commitments. I will expand on each of these in turn. First, I propose intra-group divergence to characterize the big tent aspect of Catholicism. When speaking about Catholicism as a denomination in the US, it is easy to make note of common experiences and unique social locations that Catholics have shared at various points in the nation's history. Yet the Catholic Church in the US houses so many different religious orders, movements, sub-traditions, and ministries that when speaking about a person's affiliation to Catholicism, it is important to inquire further as to the particular Catholicism they are linked to. The Catholic Church is a community of communities, to cite theologian Hoffman Ospino. And often this might be the case even at the parish level, both in terms of ethnic diversity and also in terms of theological distinctions. Locating a particular justice within a specific Catholic space is important, but that's not the only reason behind my spotlighting this idea of intra-group divergence. As someone who is interested in the micro-sociology of institutional diversity, I wonder about how the diversity of the Catholic Church plays out in the lives of these Catholics. That is, how do Catholics negotiate intra-group divergence within their close relational ties, and how does this diversity shape their decision-making processes? Certainly, the particular theologies that individual Catholics subscribe to, for example, have the potential for shaping their life decisions. But what of the conversations and interactions they might be having with other Catholics that differ from them? We must consider how in this community of communities, conversations are taking place across a broad range of positionalities. In my research on Latinx majority Catholic parishes, for example, I observed that sometimes within the same parish, there are progressive ministries operating alongside of conservative ministries. At one parish I visited, for example, there was a justice-oriented group hosting a forum on public school safety and inclusion that included queer and interfaith representation. And in another building of the same parish, at the same time, there was a gathering sponsored by a group that was against abortion. This was a specific parish, of course, but I do wonder how conversations might take place in situations where people from the same households or social networks are participating in these distinct activities. The next point I offer is in some ways, the other side of the coin to intra-group divergence. Here I consider the totalizing effects of institutional pronouncement, pronouncements made within Catholic churches or by the Catholic Church and made public through official statements. In particular, I want to consider the role of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and some of the stances taken therein. U.S. bishops take public stances on many types of issues. Some of these issues directly affect Catholic institutions, such as Supreme Court rulings related to health care with implications toward birth control. 
It is perhaps more logical that U.S. bishops would take a public stance on such issues as they pose challenges to Catholic institutions. In other cases, U.S. bishops take stances related to broader issues that have far-reaching societal effects beyond Catholic institutions. We must note the unique place of the Catholic Church in these types of pronouncements. Certainly all denominations have overseeing bodies that can issue statements related to potential Supreme Court rulings. However, when we think about the size of the Catholic Church as the largest denomination in the U.S., encompassing about one in five of every adult in the U.S., we are talking about a major religious body unlike any other. Catholic justices must consider the extent to which they will be persuaded by the official stances taken by church representatives and the church hierarchy and to what extent they will be in conversation with these type of pronouncements. Finally, I note the place of individual commitments to the Catholic Church. Here I consider both personal histories and current participation. To what extent have these Supreme Court justices been socialized into Catholic institutions, for example? What theological influences did these institutions provide them with? Was Catholic social teaching a part of their theological socialization, for example? If nothing else, we may note the propensity of Catholic institutions for intellectually preparing candidates for high office. Six of the seven Catholic raised justices were educated within Catholic high schools. Justice Kavanaugh, for example, spoke of his Jesuit commitments, partly in connection to his high school education. Justice Gorsuch attended the same elite prep school as Kavanaugh, though he is now Episcopalian. Along with the theological resources provided within these schools, we might also consider the elite nature of said institutions and the extent to which they might distance students within this Catholic, from, I'm sorry, from Catholic working class populations. Justice Thomas, for example, was the first black student within his Catholic high school alma mater. I would be concerned then if justices do not interact with the growing share of the Catholic church represented by Latinx, Asian American, and black diasporic populations. And of course, when considering current commitments, perhaps the most obvious side of activity would be participation within a local parish. In Kavanaugh's case, for example, at the announcement of his nomination, we see the presence of his former pastor, Father John Ensler. These ongoing commitments are meant to signal a certain character by these justices. For some time, it appears that the justices who frequently attend mass have ruled more conservatively, and this is a matter that sociologists have commented on. Certainly this measure has been debated, but the pattern has generally held. Most, ju uh, most recently, Justice Barrett's participation in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal was brought under public scrutiny. Bringing that detail into focus for a moment, I would consider both how the theologies of charismatic Christianity broadly and the social ties the movement brings about might influence Justice Barrett. I wonder, for example, if the global nature of the charismatic renewal might offer opportunities to feel a sense of commonality with the significant number of Latinos who are part of the Catholic charismatic renewal. For the time being, it seems that this particular influence hasn't shown up in her rulings related to immigration, I must add. We do have on the court, finally, a Latina justice who is Catholic, in fact, the only Catholic appointed by a Democrat, Justice Sotomayor. As noted by law professor, Dr. Kathleen Cavani, Justice Sotomayor is operating in accordance with the commitments of the Catholic social justice tradition, which is emphasizing inclusion, solidarity, and justice to those least among us. And my final point is to say that perhaps one of the biggest takeaways then is the potential for Catholicism to bring together to the same table, a disparate group of people and hold them accountable to each other and to the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Mary Ann, please. Hi, I'm delighted to be here and just somewhat um, daunted by the fact that I've got 10 minutes to talk about a topic that could take uh, 10 days from sunrise to sunset. 
I am going to be focusing us more narrowly on the originally uh, presented question, which is the effect of Catholicism on judicial reasoning. And I'm going to note uh, the title of the, uh, sim of, the, of the event is Catholics and the Court. The definite article is very interesting on, in both the case of the court and what I'm going to be talking about, the church. Uh, I take the court in this case to be the Supreme Court, and I'm going to be focusing largely on uh, what Supreme Court justices uh, have to say. And um, in contradistinction to Julie, I'm going to take the position that there definitely is a Catholic way of reasoning uh, that uh, is worth talking about and that may differ from judge to judge, but about which general things can be said. So let me first uh, set the stage by saying Catholics have been part of the Supreme Court since the 19th century, but until um, the late 20th century, there was something like a Catholic seat. That is to say, there was one Catholic justice at, at a time, and the notion was he would be replaced by another uh, Catholic. Um, I think it's worth noting that uh, among the earliest of the Catholic justices uh, was Roger Taney, the uh, author of Dred Scott. And uh, if I had the 10 hours rather than the 10 minutes, I would talk about the ways in which uh, Dred Scott with all of its uh, horribleness uh, can be traced some elements of uh, Catholic uh, theological reason. But I don't have that amount of time. So I'm gonna focus mostly on the Catholics currently on the court. Um, but I will also, if time permits, talk about as the other speakers have, the diversity uh, of Catholic views, including uh, the left-right diversity, uh, and say that uh, there is a that Justice Brennan um, and Justice Sotomayor are what Catholics might call Francis Catholics. The bulk of the Catholics on the court are not that, um, and it's them I'm going to be focusing on the sort of the conservative. Uh, Catholics uh, currently uh, on the court, plus Justice Kennedy. Uh, time permitting, I would talk about what Catherine Frankie, uh, I think, had a, as a provocation here, which is that Brennan and Kennedy uh, both had a particular um, emphasis on dignity, interestingly, a word that does not appear in the United States Constitution at all. And some of my friends on the left progressive end want to introduce, and I am with Columbia, former Columbia professor Sam Moyne in saying, be careful what you wish for. Dignity is a word that is not empty and open for filling, but full of uh, Catholic meaning as uh, Sam sets out in his uh, book, Christian uh, Human Rights, and Justice Kennedy's approach to dignity, or what I call dignities, including in the abortion cases, uh, suffers from that problem. And uh, I'm therefore uh, opposed to more dignity in the United States Constitution. But the bulk of my um, focus is going to be on um, one of my specialties, which is um, the religion clauses. And I'll start with what's a commonplace among scholars of religion, which is that um, secular religious systems, systems that establish some sort of separation between church and state, indeed legal systems uh, on all topics, have a religious flavor, even if they are not uh, part of an established church. There are Protestant, uh, Jewish, uh, Muslim and Catholic approaches to law, to legal reasoning, and to the relationship uh, between church and state. Um, the United States famously um, starts with uh, Jefferson, um, or famously focuses on Jefferson in his letter to the Danbury Baptists on the wall of separation uh, between church and state. And that's important because um, the United States is the land typically of disorganized religion. Um, and the Danbury Baptists are part of that, also individual religion, where corporate religious rights are seen to be, R-I-G-H-T-S, are seen to be an outgrowth of individual rights until very recently, until the Roberts Court. So I wanna start by uh, noting that there are three foundational documents, now that we're supposed to care about originalism, uh, on the relationship of the government to um, religion and the church and believers. 
Uh, Jefferson's, again, is the uh, central and most famous. Before that, there was Roger Williams, who focused on their, uh, the need for separation between church and state to protect the church uh, from the predations, from the invasion, from the corruption of the um, state. Um, what's coming back into play, both as a document, as a concept, is another letter Jefferson wrote that uh, is not generally cited in the case books and the uh, law review articles. Uh, Jefferson also wrote a letter to uh, the nuns of the Order of St. Ursula in New Orleans in 1804. And the nuns of the Order of St. Ursula, like the Danbury Baptists, wrote to Jefferson say, out of concern that their religious freedom would not be respected. I'm going to take a moment to read his response because you'll see he, their concern about religious freedom is very different, very Catholic. Um, he writes, I've received Holy Sisters the letters you have written me, wherein you express anxiety for the property vested in your institution by the former governments of Louisiana, so shortly after the Louisiana Purchase. The principles of the Constitution and government of the United States are a sure guarantee that it will be preserved to you sacred and inviolate, and that your institution will be permitted to govern itself according to its own voluntary rules without interference from the civil authority. Whatever diversity of shade may appear in the religious opinions of our fellow citizens, the charitable objects of your institution cannot be indifferent to any and its furtherance of the wholesome purposes of society by training up its younger members in the way they should go cannot fail to ensure it to the patronage of the government it is under. Be assured it will meet all the protection which my office can give it. Now you can see here a whole lot of the concerns that have motivated Catholics in their interaction with the law and Catholic justices in their uh, changes in the law uh, from 1804 to the present and now squarely into the, into the future. Um, it's about Catholic property, it's about the institutional church, it's about charitable and educational um, organization. Um, and, you know, well, the uh, Protestant framers were concerned that the church not acquire too much property and with it too much power, uh, the Catholic church wants to keep its property and expand its property. Now, let me um, fast forward to where that puts us in terms of recent massive changes in the law of the relationship uh, of church and state. Uh, and I want to claim that the, um, the brains behind this operation is uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Um, and he has, uh, it's Chief Justice Roberts is a, is a, a long game player. He plants a, a, a seed and he knows what the tree is going to look like and uh, nobody else quite does yet. And, and therefore, in, early in his tenure, they let him plant uh, such a tree. And now that the, the uh, uh, more liberal justices have been, mu been much more cautious. Uh, but I want to uh, center uh, the, the change in uh, a case called uh, Hosanna Tabor um, uh, v. Uh, EEOC. Um, Hosanna Tabor was a, was a Lutheran uh, school, uh, uh, but the, the concept behind this is a, is a very Catholic corporatist uh, concept. The question was whether the ministerial exception would allow um, religious institutions uh, free of interference from the anti-discrimination law, sex, race, uh, handicap was the issue in Hosanna Tabor uh, to determine who, who their membership was. And I think one of the first things to notice about this case is that it's the first corporatist uh, view of both the establishment and free exercise clause, uh, that it's about the church rather than the individual believers who either individually or together come into a church structure. I have a, a draft in progress in which I call Hosanna Tabor, uh, citizens of the city of God united because it fits in with so much of the corporatist vision of the rest of the Roberts uh, court. And he begins by uh, telling a, a completely alternate history of the uh, religion clauses, which starts not with uh, Madison's memorial and remonstrance, which is, uh, you know, even if you only pay two pennies worth of tax to support a religious institution, that's terrible. He starts, of all things, with Magna Carta, which wasn't cited in uh, only in footnotes in the briefs, never before in cases. And he says, you know, the foundation of American religious liberty is the, the line in Magna Carta that says the English church shall be free. Um, you know, 
we've had the Trump administration recently uh, commemorate Thomas Beckett on the occasion of his feast day. Uh, the fight between Beckett and Henry the uh, Second is similarly about the church and its freedom. There's a whole slew of uh, law and religion scholars who write about what they call the freedom of the church. Roberts doesn't quite go there, but he does look at the church from a corporatist uh, point of view. And so do recent decisions, some that are familiar to you, like the Hobby Lobby decision, its successor Zubik. Uh, which was about, uh, Zubik is an archbishop and he's claiming uh, rights for his, uh, for the, for the uh, institutions under his control. And um, this corporatist view has led to a reversal, for example, on views on aid to schools. Now, uh, my personal relationship to uh, Catholic education uh, is also a K through 12 Catholic education uh, in New York, where what I was, uh, I'm, I'm older than the rest of the panelists, so the, uh, and what I was supposed to uh, protest was uh, no aid to public, to, to Catholic schools, the so-called Blaine Amendment. Uh, I did posters saying vote no, Blaine must go, only to learn that the answer was vote yes, Blaine's a mess, uh, because we needed to get rid of prohibitions on aid to parochial schools. Uh, we've now seen this past uh, summer uh, aid to parochial schools on their way to being not only permitted but mandated and simultaneously government control over those schools uh, being reduced as the ministerial exception is extended uh, not to people uh, actually denominated ministers uh, but people but but uh, people simply uh, teaching kindergarten uh, and starting with a Hail Mary. I see I'm out of time. I'll take one brief moment so I, uh, to say something about the question and answer session if you wanna follow up. Um, again, there's a difference between the Francis Catholic and uh, the conservative Catholics, the corporatist Catholic and the individual Catholic. And uh, another through line besides the corporatist line is the through line uh, of uh, dignity. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, so I'm gonna, for our next section of the event this evening, I'm gonna pose a few questions to the panel to get them in conversation with each other um, and with me. And as I'm doing that, I would invite all of you out there in Zoom land to start typing your questions into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll move to those next. So be formulating and um, posing your questions now. Um, the first thing I'd, I wanted to ask really for any or maybe all of you is uh, in some ways, I think a panel like this um, uh, teases the question of whether Catholic doctrine might sneak into uh, constitutional or Supreme Court jurisprudence. But I think there's another way to frame it, which is, is there a, can you imagine a way of service on the Supreme Court affecting the Catholic identity, the Catholic practice of the members of the court for whom their Catholic or their Catholic identity is an important part of who they are. Um, uh, and service is an important part of almost every religious tradition um, and uniquely so in, in, the, um, in the Catholic tradition. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of this kind of public service and responsibility to the state and to the nation may have some influence on how they see themselves or practice their own Catholicism. So you know, please jump in any of you if you have a sense of that um, uh, being the, the, the influence working in the other direction than we, than we may have thought of uh, initially in framing the questions for this panel. Don't make me call on you. <laughs> Jonathan, what do you think? Well, I, I have a brief response, which is um, one of the things that comes to my mind is um, the role of Catholic education in particular intertwined with the sense of service that you were describing and specifically uh, tied in with um, intellectual Catholic tradition. And so, and I think Julie was naming that even, uh, Julie, when you were talking about um, Gorsuch's um, education at Oxford and even tracing that tradition uh, in his particular trajectory, uh, thinking about how service is tied into 
this type of intellectual commitment and the formation of a leader through that type of intertwining between faith and uh, and education, the preparation that comes with it. I think it's a simple observation, I think, but it, but from what I'm seeing, the pattern that I that that I've observed is that it's quite prominent in the lives of these uh, justices. Julie, you want to pick that up? Sorry, I'll come back to you in a second, Marianne. So let, me, let Julie go. Julie, go. Julie, you go ahead, and then we'll come back to Marianne. As you said, um, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, I might be frozen. Yeah, you're all right. You got me now. Yes. Okay. So, uh, as you were saying, Catherine, the idea of service and um, being of good use in one's talents to the wider public and um, and it, to government as well, um, the government of the land, I think is to my mind, one of those things that's so common across different religious traditions that it is really, really hard to nail down to the Catholic tradition. Um, it's there, of course, and different justices in wanting to explain where they got their sense of service to the public might resort to Catholic educational principles to explain it. Um, but, but I just think it is um, finally, you know, not particularly Catholic. And um, the, the, what I was trying to refer to in my talk was the idea of, you know, singularizing something about Catholicism as a way of um, making it, uh, you know, a um, you know, a, a, a tradition that lives up to one's sentiment, sentimentality about it, or, um, you know, criticizes it in turn. And I, and I just think that um, it would have to be super, you know, individual in terms of the narratives of, you know, what led each su Catholic Supreme Court justice to um, his or her life of service. And, um, and then, you know, in the way you framed the question, uh, how the service itself changes their Catholic practice. That would be a whole nother thing that I'd love to hear more about, but Supreme Court justices have been famously non-disclosive except for dearly departed um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the last years of her life on telling us, you know, what all was going down in their thinking um, as they were justices. So we'll have to wait on that, but I'll, I'll open it up to others ideas too. So I, I hate to be Debbie Downer on this, uh, but I would say the influence of Catholic education uh, has been um, in the first place to in, intensify a sense of grievances on the part of the uh, you know male justices. Uh, they are they, they they've been they growing up feeling persecuted as Catholics, feeling deprived of government subsidies as Catholics, and Alito in particular. Uh, seems angry, Alito and Kavanaugh both seem angry about this, and this comes out in their jurisprudence about things like aid to the church and discrimination uh, against uh, the church. I'll also note with respect to education that, um, ex that the, except for Alito, I believe, um, the male Catholic justices are all the product of single sex Catholic education. The male Catholic justices, I don't know about Kennedy, but Scalia and the existing male Catholic justices are the product of single sex Catholic education. I think it is no accident uh, that the two sex harassers uh, or alleged sex harassers on the court are the product of single sex, uh, all boys uh, Catholic education there, Justice Thomas uh, and Justice uh, Kavanaugh. And that Scalia was the lone dissenter Thomas would have joined him had his son not been a student at VMI, uh, writing in VMI about how, uh, but for separation uh, between the sexes, uh, all uh, courteous treatment of uh, women uh, by men would disappear. There's a lot in there, Mary Ann, of, um, that is um, really quite um, provocative, which I think we'll come back to. And, and I'm seeing in some of the questions from the audience, um, also want to touch on some of these issues. 
May I follow up on that? You may, sure, Julie. Uh, Marianne, totally agree with you on everything. And, and just wanted to ask though, if there is, you know, a, a strong overlap um, between the white male grievance, generally speaking, of, of um, you know, of, of educated classes uh, for different reasons, um, perhaps not coming up through Catholic school where that particular grievance would have been nurtured, but, um, but in a whole number of venues that have been, you know, atomized by different conservative causes. In other words, so um, this is, you know, U.S. Catholic bishop clerical priorities in all male Catholic schools that um, shares a lot with white evangelical Protestant circles cultivating the same grievance about the same things. Yeah, so here's what I think. First of all, I, I neglected to mention that the only one of the current justices that I don't think was uh, a product of uh, K, K through 12, um, all male Catholic education or some portion of that is Alito. And he famously opposed the admission of women to Princeton when he was a Princeton undergrad. But circling back to your point, Julie, I would say the same thing about white male grievance as I said about separation of church and state. It comes in important flavors. There's a Catholic flavor, there's an evangelical flavor, and it matters. The, the evangelical flavor is we're used to being in charge and we feel a sense of a, an understandable but not justifiable sense of loss and grievance when that dominance is taken away from us. The Catholic flavor is we're used to not being in charge and we have uh, maintained uh, in our bones a heritage of, of uh, aggravation at discrimination and um, being despised. So, uh, you know, they can come together, they can even come together in the person of uh, someone like Amy Comey Barrett, who is, a, I mean, I don't know whether they will, but they could, um, in the person of Catholics with an evangelical flavor. Uh, Pompeo is an example of this, right? But I think the flavor is important. The I'm losing my power and I should have had power all along and now is my time to get it um, is our a, a significant differences. And I, I will just say, I'll put in a plug, differences that work differently uh, for the male justices than they do for the Catholic population as it shows up in surveys. I've written a paper uh, about explaining in part why it is that um, Catholics were 20% ahead of the general population in favor of same-sex marriage uh, for most of the period uh, before Obergefell, even though their bishops were telling them same-sex marriage is a bad idea. And I said, that was because Catholics could separate what their religion required and what the secular law required, whereas the Protestants had become dependent on the secular law and had this uh, understandable, though not justifiable sense of grievance when that was taken away. So to bring it back to the schools, what the Catholics always wanted was to be included. They only set up separate Catholic schools when they were not included. Included. Uh, what the Protestants had was dominance, and that dominance was taken away uh, starting in the mid 20th century with all of the cases about prayer in the schools and Ten Commandments in the schools and eventually evolution in the schools. So um, Protestant evangelicals and Catholics have come together over charter school and, um, you know, uh, denominational school subsidies from exactly opposite directions. We wanted power and now we can have it. We had power and now we've lost it. And if we can't control the public schools, you at least have to let us uh, exit as a second best strategy, uh, us conservative Protestants. Right, I, I really appreciate that, that narrative and that the flavors matter. And I might, I might ask, Jonathan, um, what he thinks here is, as well, though, just to um, tap, tap all our papers in the conversation. But I, I feel like I am never sure if after a sort of um, late 1970s, 1980s alliance between uh, Roman Catholics and evangelical Protestants, um, white Roman Catholic, evangelical Protestants for that matter, um, in the in the general population and the uh, in in political causes, conservative political causes, and then the um, uh, 
and then the um oh what was i going to say and then the, the actual lived experience of any particular catholic kid going th through schools at those times if it ever um was clear to them that a uh, longer durée history of catholics are less empowered and uh, evangelicals have been empowered that that um, difference in historical privilege and difference in historical positioning, I'm not sure was ever clear to the Catholic kids coming up in, you know, the Georgetown school that Brett Kavanaugh um, um, graduated from where he, you know, for all intents and purposes, we know, you know, got the extremely liberal Jesuit version of Catholicism and was super, super entitled with never a sense that they lost anything. So it's really just like that granular sense of each individual person's um, uh, journey that I don't think we're ever sure of to be able to narrate in the way you're describing. So, I mean, again, I am, I am generalizing and I, I mean, obviously each individual person is individual, but I will tell you that uh, although my Catholic, I mean, I, I grew up uh, poverty level in the inner city, uh, nowhere near Georgetown prep, but when I read, when I listen to uh, Kavanaugh's uh, questions during oral argument, when I read the things he writes, when I read the things Alito writes, I recognize, I mean, it was never, I mean, viscerally my sense of grievance, but I recognize this very, very, very well. I mean, this, the notion that uh, the Blaine Amendments, which are uh, these in their original intent, deliberately anti-Catholic amendments that uh, existed in the vast majority of states that essentially said uh, no government money should go to uh, religious institutions, uh, including but not limited to religious schools, directly or indirectly. Uh, I, you know, even if you're at Georgetown Prep, which is very well funded, I wouldn't be surprised if there was the same kind of lobbying effort um, that, that, in the same way as you say, you recognize it about abortion. And I think every American now recognizes that the Catholic Church is lobbying its uh, faithful about abortion. Um, when I was young, they were lobbying their faithful about more aid to their parochial schools, the rich faithful as well as their poor faithful. Can I, I'd like to draw Jonathan into this discussion. I can see you, you have some, some thoughts, so please. Yeah, a couple of points here. Well, uh, number one, I wanted to agree uh, with Marianne about this, uh, this confluence between um, evangelicals and conservative Catholics uh, in some ways coming from different directions and yet finding some uh, commonality there. And in fact, one of the things I wanted to point out is that our former president, uh, now exited, of course, was in some ways working to to build on that potential confluence, I think, uh, in terms of garnering votes. And so seeing a, a, an opportunity there in bringing together these particular uh, constituencies, uh, even as Marianne has named that they were coming in some ways uh, at these issues from different directions. So I, I really appreciated that comment. Um, I'm also thinking about um, the ethnic racial dynamic here. From so much of the research that I can that I have conducted and that I conduct is within uh, Latinx communities, and so seeing the particular stream there and the difference in terms of how parochial schools have been engaged within that community. I think uh, even as that becomes an ever larger share of uh, the Catholic population in the US, uh, that history isn't quite there yet in terms of parochial schools being one of the primary means of uh, upward mobility. Now, we're starting to see that happening now, but it's, it's lagged behind uh, in comparison to some of the other uh, populations, particularly white ethnics. And I think, Julie, I think you used that term, if I recall, uh, white ethnics. And, um, and so we see the difference in terms of the, the place of parochial schools uh, in providing opportunities uh, of social mobility within the Latinx population. And, and so for me, I think it's important to 
to ask the question of will these continue to be pathways uh, of mobility uh, even into some of these roles that we are discussing here, such as in the Supreme Court and whatnot. Now, of course, we have um, Justice Sotomayor there, but will we continue to see now um, others that can trace their, their heritage from working class immigrants into uh, positions of influence such as these? So, so that's one of the things that I've got my eye on personally. You know, I'm, it, it's one of the things that's intrigued me about this discussion um, in the sense of um, an idea that Marianne introduced about this, this idea of resentment of having been left out or persecuted that I think Catholics certainly aren't the only ones who have experienced that, um, but have, certain, have certainly experienced that. Could cut in two ways, I think, or maybe more than two ways in terms of a justice's participation on the court, someone like Kavanaugh or Alito it could cut in the in the direction of evacuating the state even more from certain aspects of civil society, um, uh, and which is largely what's happened with the religious liberty claims, as the state has no business regulating certain things that um, we have religious objections to. So the state must be must withdraw to allow our religious um, beliefs and practices to flourish, or it could be an invitation for a larger presence of the state in aspects of civil society, say to enforce a non-discrimination norm um, based on religion in a range of private contexts, not just public contexts. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of the, the particular Catholic nature of each of these justices, whether you think they will in the long run lean into a kind of religious liberty evacuating the state from private contexts, politic, or interpretation of the law and in terms of how their, mo their resentment gets mobilized or actually favor forms of state regulation that secure and protect um, value pluralism, religious pluralism and religious equality in a range of those contexts. Um, I think the answer is both and if we're talking about religious views familiar and um, congenial to them and uh, neither nor in other cases. So I've said in print about this, uh, but the whole debate about uh, exempting uh, marriage objectors and others uh, and abortion objectors from uh, laws that what um, people like the uh, conservative Catholic justices on the court and um, the people uh, who bring litigation like this want is to have their cake, eat it too and shove it down my throat in the sense that what they want is the state not to regulate the church, the state to have to subsidize the church and the state to regulate all other institutions in which members uh, of the church might wish to enter. So no one is suggesting that a uh, left liberal gay rights organization can choose not to hire uh, an anti-gay uh, Catholic, but they are suggesting, I mean, so again, it's both and. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, favoring of um, views on religious freedom that are not theirs, I think all we have to look at is the death penalty cases. And I don't mean the ones about killing people. I mean about the ones about allowing people to have their um, religious uh, leader of choice with them at the moment they die. The Catholic justices, not only uh, the, the conservative ones, not only have uh, contrary to what Pope Francis has recently said is mandatory Catholic doctrine, uh, not objected to the death penalty by and large, they in a series of um, you know, a, appeals uh, for injunctions have said, we're not even gonna pause the execution of a Buddhist who wants to be accompanied by a Buddhist or another, a person of a faith other than the uh, chaplain's faith in the state to be accompanied at the moment of death by their chosen spiritual advisor. Now that is, you know, I mean, Catholic doctrine thinks the moment of death is all important, that repenting, uh, that finding faith at the moment of death is all it takes to get you into heaven, even if you're Voltaire, even if you're uh, Saad, even if you're Don Giovanni, as opera goers will know. Um, but they, but the, these justices have not even given a hearing to the notion that a Buddhist should be uh, allowed to make the case that he should be accompanied by a Buddhist. 
So I'd like to uh, again invite the folks um, in our audience to um, pose questions, not by raising your hand, but by um, writing your questions in the Q&A um, function at the bottom right of your screen. And we'll try in our remaining time to get to as many of those as we can. Um, there's, a, there's a question um, for, for Julie uh, that to get us started from one of our audience members is to ask you to speak more on the existence of non-Roman Catholics and in what sense they are Catholics? Sure, well, uh, thank you very much for the question. And um, it's a phrase that can throw people for a loop sometimes, um, non-Roman Catholic, because certainly in um, many public contexts, the idea is just that if you're talking about Catholics, you're talking about Roman Catholics. Um, and I wrote a, a whole book on the other Catholics, <laughs> Catholics that are Catholic, but not Roman Catholic. And there are actually quite a lot of varieties of them. And, um, and in the book, I do some work to say, you know, what's Catholic about all of them, um, both uh, non-Roman Catholics and Roman Catholics as a category. Um, but, uh, but, but the one I mentioned tonight was yes, that the uh, Anglican communion has long identified as both Protestant and Catholic, and um, and uh, there's there's lots of groups like that. There are independent Catholics. There's the old Catholic Church of um, the Netherlands that has branches all over the world, and um, and a number of others. So um, that's just a real gloss on it, and I uh, hope it helps. Thank you. Um, I just to bundle a couple of questions that I've seen that have had that have also been concerned about the kind of lumping rather than splitting of Protestants into one group. Very often we, th we hear about the, the evangelical Protestant vote for Trump. And wasn't that surprising because he seems to be such a, um, lives his life in all of its aspects in contradistinction to the, to the, the basic precepts of evangelical Christianity. Um, but is there some way that we might want to disaggregate that bundle, that group of Protestant vote for, for Trump and see it as, as diverse a group as Jonathan was noting around, um, you know, intergroup divergence in the Catholic community? So we've been talking a lot about Catholic, Catholics. Marianne introduced um, some, uh, some thinking about Protestants and their sense of entitlement. But Protestants also need to be um, uh, disaggregated from their more evangelical kinds, the kind of um, international Protestantism um, and others. So Jonathan, if I can invite you to kind of weigh in on that issue, I, we appreciate it. Yeah, well, you know, great question. And I'll actually tie it back to something that Marianne said earlier about um, the sense of entitlement, the sense of being in power that uh, evangelicals may exhibit. And something that's interesting there is that we have to consider that in some ways that that's a perception in the sense that some evangelicals, um, they see themselves, they envision themselves within this larger Protestant history and, and inscribe themselves upon a particular narrative of U.S. history. Um, even as some of them come from uh, certain traditions that that weren't really part of those original traditions and I'm and in some cases even in terms of ethnic traditions and I see this even in the communities that I've studied where um you know immigrant evangelicals will sometimes envision themselves within the national history within a particular narrative or uh understanding of U.S. history uh as Protestants even though they're coming you know from a very different uh, place. And so one of the interesting things there is, yes, they see themselves as entitled to power, but actually some of them have gone through a season of not being in power because they come from a more perhaps low church type of background. Um, some of my research has been in Pentecostalism, for example. And so Pentecostalism, for, for which gets lumped into evangelicalism, um, many Pentecostals were really looked down upon for for a certain period of time um, since the inception of Pentecostalism. And so that's interesting. Um, now, the other side of the coin with Pentecostalism is some of the connection that we might see there 
between Pentecostalism and the charismatic, the Catholic charismatic renewal, which is something I mentioned um, with Justice Barrett in terms of uh, her particular practice. And so that presents the other side of the coin of uh, potential points of, of connection between some Catholics and some uh, Protestants that are more Pentecostal leaning, where they will see some commonality in terms of theology around beliefs, uh, charismatic beliefs. So, really I am focused um, on their treatment to the of, by the law and their interaction with legal norms. And, I, and there are certainly groups that are not Catholic that have had uh, in various periods of time run-ins with the law. The Mormons, the, Mormons, the yeah. Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. But from the time of Jefferson to the mid-20th century, the Baptists, for example, had the law going their way, right? Um, in the sense that uh, their idea of marriage, their idea of uh, you know what version of the Bible should be taught in the schools was all theirs. And again, one of my favorite go-to examples is that it wasn't until the late 90s that the Southern Baptists included in its Doctrine and Covenant the proposition that it was a wife's duty graciously to submit to her husband's servant leadership. Why that late? Certainly not a new idea for the Baptists in the 90s, but before that time, they could count on the law enforcing it for them through Blackstone, through coverture, through hierarchical uh, gender relations in marriage. And the Ruth Bader Ginsburg revolution made that impossible. Um, and they then had to do, I mean, what Catholics did a century earlier, which is in a sense, privatize their uh, rules and their approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, in, in also what you're describing, I think it, it even speaks to some of these internal culture wars that are happening in denominations, you know, a number of Protestant denominations that are splitting and whatnot, which is that as laws become more in inclusive, you know, some of them, there are factions within these denominations wanting to hold on to these more particularistic, uh, more uh, strict uh, moral codes around certain issues. And so, you know, we're seeing entire denominations split uh, because as you named, uh, now that the law isn't necessarily uh, on the side of some of these factions, they're now attempting to sort of stabilize within the denomination, their particular or, or concretize their particular moral codes within the denomination. Right. right. And their institutional structures, right? Catholic parochial schools were a thing in the 19th century. Um, evangelical Protestant parochial schools were a thing only in the mid 20th century, uh, dually caused by uh, desegregation, which uh, the Southern uh, Baptists didn't like, and by the removal of prayer from the schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Marianne, picking up, keeping, keeping you on the screen here, um, I want to ask you, 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 you teased us with a bunch of things in your opening remarks. And so I'm going to go back to one of them, which is whether you can give us some examples of a tension that you gestured towards between an expansive Catholic biblical interpretation and the textualist or originalist interpretation, sometimes seen as quite narrow, um, of the Constitution according to what would otherwise be understood as secular rules. So I first want to say um, another whole line of thinking would be the relationship of Catholics to originalism and how it might differ from a Protestant version of originalism. And a Protestant version of, you know, to the best of my knowledge, only countries uh, with uh, some Protestant fundamentalism, that is to say the notion that the Bible is the infallible word of God have had strong originalist interpretive traditions. And my standard line on this is, of course you would care about original intent and understanding if the, if the intender is God. Uh, the founders, great though they may be, are not God. Uh, but I wanted to you know, sort of focus on things like Justice Scalia. When Justice Scalia famously says, I am an originalist, but I am not a nut, that can be seen as a Catholic statement, right? The Catholic Church has not ever thought of the Bible as irrelevant, 
but it has not thought of it as infallible. It has uh, you know, considered case law as Scalia does. It is considered precedent. It is considered all kinds of other uh, things uh, in its uh, interpretation. So I think there, there's a whole nother fruitful line we could have uh, of discussion of the way in which habits of mind, uh, reasoning about texts that are religious texts and laws that are religious laws, um, consciously or subconsciously influence judicial reasoning. I mean, when I teach my law and religion class, I ask the students to tell me if they want to, uh, what religion they currently are affiliated with, but, but certainly what religious traditions they were brought up in, whether as members or not, whether they were, you know, the black Protestant kid in a Catholic school or, you know, the only um, Hindu in, uh, you know, a Texas public school, because those habits of mind are, I think, part of the influence of Catholicism on the court. Mm -hmm. Ditto Protestantism, ditto Judaism, in all its many flavors of each tradition. Right. So let me, let me pose another um, uh, question from our audience to really whoever would like to answer this, maybe all of you. Um, what trajectory does the panel envision for evangelical Protestants agitating at the national level for additional Protestants on the Supreme Court? And here the person's thinking that this inquiry to, um, uh, is relevant to issues for which they've historically stood against, gays and reproductive rights, the rights of gay people or LGBT people, and reproductive rights, which I would note were secured at least most recently by Catholic members of the court. Um, so if if in the, the form of Justice Kennedy, hold on one second, Marianne, I'm gonna let the other two weigh in and then I'm gonna come back to you. So um, if, if there's some sense that Protestant justices will come to the rescue now that we have these conservative Catholics on the court, notwithstanding the historical record, which shows that it was actually a somewhat liberal Catholic that came to the rescue for LGBT rights and reproductive rights. Um, do, you, do you have a kind of sense of where the mobilizing around religion in the court as a rights respecting in liberal uh, institution may be going? Julie, let me start with you. Well, first of all, I want to say that this question um, I see comes from my, um, my friend James, with whom I went through most of K through 12 Catholic school in Pennsylvania. So um, hi to James and thanks for being here and thanks for the question. I, um, I am really don't have my finger on the pulse of um, evangelical Protestant agitation activism to um, get Supreme Court justices confirmed from um, those particular traditions. And all I would say is that it goes back to what um, Professor Maggie McGinnis said that I quoted earlier, where the relevant thing for the political right and left in the country, I think is less about religion and more about um, you know, political formation, um, whether it comes from Catholic or Protestant or um, Muslim or Jewish or, um, or you know, uh, any other traditions sides. There's, there's, you know, at Notre Dame, for example, um, you know, there's a longstanding hiring policy that, um, that prefers has affirmative action for Holy Cross priests for one thing, but then it also um, has a sort of informal, you know, looking to hire people who care deeply about religion, um, whatever the religion is, rather than um, those who are um, those who are lightly held in their faith or were only raised in it, and um, and and that's kind of part of what I see as a, as a an, an emphasis in conservative circles that you know. We don't care what religion you are, as long as you are strongly for religions, freedoms, uh, interpretation of the of the First Amendment of the Constitution in a conservative way, and um, and frankly, there are more you know Catholics, um, uh, there are more conservatives, um, you know who are Catholic in the on the Supreme Court now, mostly because conservatives have been better at 
forming those pipelines of influence to confirmation of the Supreme Court than, than uh, liberal institutions have. Um, and I, I don't think it has had to do so much with, um, with uh, Catholic or Protestant. I think it has had to do with Christianity versus other religions, but Catholic Protestant is, you know, allied in this on the conservative side and has been, like I said, since Roe v. Wade and through the through the 80s. And so uh, um, I'm, it would be news to me if there was, you know, oh, we, you know, we need to quit getting Catholic conservatives on the court and we need to get some um, get some uh, Protestant conservatives on the court. That said, I do know that, you know, anti-Catholicism is alive and well. There are, you know, Protestants um, who are conservative in the country who still do very much um, find um, Catholicism something to be wary about, whether they're conservative or not. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Jonathan, please. Yeah, I think that we are witnessing uh, a shift in boundaries in terms of uh, coalitions in terms of uh, who people are willing to uh, align themselves with for the purposes of sustaining uh, certain conservative politics, as, as Julie was naming. And uh, a couple of things that I, that I wanna affirm that, that, that Julie mentioned. One is um, her description of the, that pipeline that's uh, shaping people and taking them into the direction of these confirmations, I think is really important. And in some ways that's what, what I was, trying to get at um, at the very beginning when I was talking about, um, but I mean, she, she, you know, Julie, you, you said it much in a much better way. That's one of the points I was sort of, that was churning in my mind about the formation, right? Um, but the other thing I wanna say is in relation to this, uh, this expansive con conservative Christianity that yes, the, the, the boundaries have perhaps I think amongst Protestants and particularly conservative evangelicals have expanded to include, to allow for conservative Catholics to be seen as, uh, as allies, as, as people that can work together towards a particular conservative agenda. Um, and also this idea of at the same time, identifying who isn't a part of that circle. And so to some extent it does it, for this maneuver to work, it does require, um, I'm not saying this should require, but within these groups to still identify those who are outside of the group. Um, so conservative Catholics can be in the group. Uh, I think for some evangelical Protestants, um, but perhaps say Muslims uh, are still not allowed or, uh, you know, atheists of course would, you know, would not be allowed into that uh, inner circle, even if they um, have some stances that are compatible, but, the fact of, you know, ha holding an uh, an openly uh, atheist uh, identity would really be seen as something that's anathema uh, for some uh, conservative ev uh, evangelical Protestants. But I do think that there is this shift. Yes, there is still anti-Catholicism, and there are still many sectors uh, within conservative evangelicalism that would uh, that are highly invested in. Um, differentiating themselves from Catholicism. Uh, nevertheless, for the purpose of political um, power, they're actually willing to say, okay, we, we'll accept these particular justices because their, their positions do align with many of our stances. And I saw this, in fact, uh, in some of the communities that I've conducted research in, I, I saw this with, uh, with Justice Barrett in terms of and again, I keep coming back to this um, charismatic inclination that she has, but um, within some of the Pentecostal sectors that I've done research in, um, there was there was an affinity there. They saw something that that they could identify with, um, even within some of the Latinx uh, communities that I've studied. Some of them saw there, oh, she's uh, we see her as a real Christian um, because of her particular commitments. And so, yes, I think that the boundaries have been expanding. Um, for the purpose of, of maintaining some sort of uh, political power. 
Thank you. You know, Jonathan, one just one comment before I turn to Marianne for her last thoughts on this. It's interesting. We haven't talked about Jews very much, and of course, there have been plenty of Jewish people, not as many, uh, but you know, Jews on the court. And it, the the last two Jewish examples of members of the court, Justices Kagan and Ginsburg, have been an interesting example of atheists who also had a religious identity because Jewish identity is, is, is in some ways more complicated. It's both an ethnic and uh, religious identity depending upon who's asking the question and who's answering it. But both of them were marked by their religions and their, um, their faith, but I don't think their faith played a role in their lives um, that is as meaningful certainly as the, for the Catholic members of the court and is probably the closest to atheistic um, identity um, uh, of anybody we've seen in the recent court. Um, so Marianne, take me on, tell me I'm wrong. No, so I, I don't know whether when you said Ginsburg, you meant Breyer, but Breyer is both someone who better fits that description and is the most, re is a more recent appointee than Ginsburg. I would, you know, one cannot see into the mind or soul of another, but I would not characterize uh, Ginsburg as uh, atheistic or even as a secular Jew. I mean, the, her death uh, brought out uh, a whole series of uh, statements by her, events in which she participated, uh, in which she was, and, and you know, Jews and Catholics, I think, have this in common, and it separates them from uh, Protestants, right, that it's about the works more than the faith. What, whatever she may have believed, she presented and practiced not as an uh, Orthodox or from or, um, you know, Haredi Jew, but as a Jew. Uh, Breyer is a lot more interesting and complicated. His daughter is an Episcopal priest or is a, is a Protestant, you know, uh, an ordained Protestant minister. I think it's an Episcopal priest. I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, and his, his reaction to religion, I would say, is much more that of what you're characterizing of uh, as an atheist or a non-believer than certainly Ginsburg's uh, and even Kagan's. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have reached the end of our time um, and we have more questions than we could address, um, which is um, not surprising given the richness of the topic and the richness of the discussion among our three panelists. And I just wanna thank all of them um, for, for bringing such careful thought to these questions. Um, and to Matthew and the, the rest of the team at the Institute for putting this together as a uh, incredibly timely and um, deep conversation about religion, law and society. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions, but I bet you know how to find our panelists through email and otherwise and have a safe evening and a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>